Alright, um, so we're gonna get started. Um, hey guys, so um, welcome to Girls in STEM. And since our meeting will run out of time, like precisely 60 minutes after, so we're just gonna get started right away. Um, I'm a junior from Canyon Crest Academy, and then our, um, oh shoot, I'm on the wrong slide. Alright, there we go. Um, and, um, and actually, do you want to? Yeah, hi, I'm Akshaya, and I'm also a junior here at CCA. I will be leading your um, class for today. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, every day we'll start off with like a question of the day, and you can see on this screen. Um, so, for today, if you can just quickly type into the chat your name, your grade, your school, and also answer the question on this slide. And for today, we're going to go over the um, first lesson, which is what is a computer. And then afterwards, you will have the knowledge quiz to complete. And also, we have prepared a um, resource page for all of you. And we're just gonna get um, wait for five minutes for you to answer the questions, and then um, wait for more people to join.
Alright, so um, I left all the responses to the questions. It's like a good mixture of both. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started with our lesson today. So again, our lesson is what is a computer and we're gonna talk about um, the history of computer and then the um, parts of the computer. We're not gonna go, we're not gonna go into like too detail because it's just like an introduction to the topic. So just like very basic. Um, the biggest part, the biggest structure, uh, or like the major structure of the computer. And it's definitely a bit content heavy, so just sit back and um, yeah, look forward to a very detailed, very good lesson here. All right. Um, you can, um, you can always refer back to the slides when you do the quiz, but if you, if you, um, if taking notes help you to like absorb the content, then definitely. Um, but yeah, all right, so I'll let Shia to like start the presentation. All right, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, as Katie mentioned, today we're going to be going over the topic of what are computers and the parts of computers and a little bit of the history. So a computer is any electronic device that takes an input um, and then it processes this information and then creates an output. Um, and this is normally done in the binary form, which is um, in zeros and ones, and based on the instructions that are given in the program. So computers, as I mentioned before, um, they take in an input, usually it's the user that gives it an input, and then it processes the information and it also stores the information um, in some devices, and then it produces an output. So here's an example of a computer. Um, this temperature monitor is seeing the temperature of the environment. And based on if it's too hot, um, this device is processing this information. And then it turns on the fan if it's too hot. And then it will turn the fan off if it's too cold. Now we're going to go into uh, someone who is a big part of computers. Uh, he is known as the father of computer science, Alan Turing, and he also created, our, or was the person who created the idea of artificial intelligence. He played a leading role in breaking Nazi ciphers in World War II, and he found that mathematical mathematics will always have an undecided proposition, and that there is no universal algorithm that proves truth in mathematics. So basically that there's no one solution to any type of question. And um, this work was the foundation of computer science and artificial intelligence. Oh, um, and if you're taking notes, I'll just leave it on for a couple seconds. Okay. Um, and then in 1936, he presented his idea of the universal machine. Um, and uh, this machine could compute anything that was computable. And it was considered the basis of the modern computer. And then in the mid 1940s, he led the design of the automatic computing engine and created successful blueprints. And this machine was also called the Pilot Ace and it influenced the design and concept of modern technology companies. And then in 1950, he wrote a paper about artificial intelligence where he proposed an experiment known as the Turing test, which attempted to create an artificial design standard for the tech industry. And it was used in debates in the past few de decades. And um, here's a link for the 
trailer of a really fascinating movie about Alan Turing, if you're interested in learning more about him. Okay, and the next um, topic is the parts of the computer. So, um, the main part of a computer is the computer block diagram system. And as we mentioned before, the parts are the input devices, um, and then the CPU, central processing unit, and then the output devices. So, um, Basically, the instructions are taken in the form of raw data, and most data is stored in the computer memory through primary and secondary devices. And we're going to get more into this in the next few slides. Okay, so the CPU processes instructions uh, based on like what the user puts into the device. So say I moved my mouse and I typed in um, Alan Turing, then that's my input to the computer. Um, and then the data enters the device through the input devices. Um, and can you guys name some in the chat? Do you guys know any input devices? So like, let's say, or I can just give you an example, um, like a microphone of a laptop is a example of input device because we are yeah. giving the um, computer data and then it's doing something with the data. Exactly. Yep, those are all great examples. Um, and then this set of instructions are processed by the CPU, and then the computer produces the output. So then this output data is expressed through the output devices. And can you guys name any of those? Um, an example would be the monitor. Yeah, exactly, a printer, speaker. Yep, those are all correct, good job. So now we're going to go more in depth with each of these sections. So the first one is the input devices. Um, and this is where the user provides instructions through like keyboards, mouse, scanner, as you guys said before. And then the data is expressed into the computer through the form of binary language, zeros and ones, as I said in the first slide. And after the processor converts this data. The input unit shows the data that is expressed by the user and it is like it's almost like a connection from the user to the computer. And then here's some examples in the corner right here. There's a keyboard, a scanner, a trackball, um, and then an MICR, a touchpad, a touch panel, joystick barcode reader and mouse and a DCR. Oh, I'm sorry, that's an OCR. Okay, and now the output devices. So these devices produce the results of our input. Examples are printers, monitors, speakers, and many others. And they are taken in as the binary form, and that's zeros and ones, as we mentioned before. And then it converts this binary language into information that is comprehensible for humans. And once it converts the output, the device displays this information. Um, and then some examples here are also in this picture. Okay, next is the central processing unit. This is an electronic hardware that can perform different types of operations like the arithmetic, arithmetic and logical operation. And it contains two parts, well, two main parts, the control unit um, and the arithmetic and logic unit. Um, so in control unit, 
it basically controls all the activities that are performed by the computer um, and it receives the information directly from the main memory and once it gets this information it changes the instructions into control signals and sends or these signals are sent to the central processor for more inf more processing and the control unit understands which steps to do and when and how so this is like basically the processing of um, the whole diagram. It's like it takes in an input and then it goes to the control unit, like we mentioned here. And then it'll go to the arithmetic and logic unit, which we'll get more into on the next slide. And then it gets processed more and then it goes back down and then it goes to the memory unit, which is where it gets all the information gets stored. And we'll also go more into that in the later slides. And then it'll go back to the control unit and then it's out, shown as an output. Okay, and then the arithmetic logic unit is an electronic circuit that can perform arithmetic actions in um, integer binary numbers. And it presents the arithmetic and logical operations on this program. So all the math, all the like the steps and the outputs of the system will change asynchronously which means that it's not done at the same time it's done step by step as a response to the input and the basic logic and arithmetic functions are supported by the alu and the cpu is a part of the electrical circuit which is typically a microprocessor Oh, and um, we'll get more into what like an electrical circuit is um, in the later slides as well. Okay, and then there's the storage or the memory unit. Um, and this is the information that is stored um, in the computer system. The data storage is the main function and it's very important for computers. Um, and con it consists of primary and secondary units. So the primary memory storage is also known as the RAM, and this is a short-term memory storage. So basically, if you turn off your computer, your data would get lost. It's like not saved for a long term, and um, it stores the operating system software, application software, and many more. Um, some, or a problem with this is that it's short, like capacity, so it doesn't like save for very long, but it is very fast compared to secondary memory storage, which is also known as the ROM. Um, and this is the long term storage. Um, some examples are flash drives, hard disk drives, or also known as the HDD, and the solid state drives, which is also known as an SSD. And this is slow and cheap memory, and it's not connected to the processor directly, but it has a large capacity to store data. And the storage is directly connected to the CPU or the central processing unit. Okay, and then now we're going more into the computer system. So the computer system has hardware and software, and the data and programs are stored in the computer of the so software. So motherboards are circuit boards that allow communication for all the important electrical parts of the computer, like the CPU and the memory. And the hardware systems are the electrical and mechanical parts of the computer. So like the actual, like the HDD, which is a secondary device. And, like all the parts that are within the computer, um, that's basically the hardware. Okay, do you guys have any questions? Or... Yep, okay. Uh, okay, so the next part of our um, today's topic is the timeline of computers and its history. Yeah, and um, just keep an eye out for the 
pink highlights. Um, there are some very important um, women STEM or very like early women STEM um, people, and they contribute definitely a lot to. Exactly. Okay, so as we learned earlier, in 1936, Alan Turing created the Turing machine, and it computed anything that was computable. And this is the central concept for all modern computers. And then in 1937, John Vincent Atanasoff proposed the idea of an all-electric computer that doesn't use belts, shafts, gears, and all the parts that were used by older computers. And then in 1941, Conrad Zeus completed his Z3 machine, and this was the world's first digital computer. And then later in 1950, he created the world's first commercial digital computer, also known as the Z4. Okay, and in 1940, Katie Lamar, who is a woman in STEM, um, was also known as the most beautiful woman in the world in Hollywood. And she discovered a remarkable technique called frequency hopping. Um, this was a big part of uh, World War II, and it eventually was used to develop Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, and all like the wireless technology that we have today. And um, she may have not literally invented Wi-Fi, but she did, or she was a big part of how it came to be today. And a continuation of 1941, um, Anna, Anna Stoff and Barry designed the first digital computer in the U.S., and it was known as the Anisoft Barry Computer, or the ABC. And it was the first computer that stored information and operated a single instruction within 15 seconds. So it was actually pretty fast for being like computers being still pretty brand new. And in 1945, Mockley and Eckbert built the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, also known as the ENIAC. And this was the first automatic digital computer. And um, it worked by plugging and unplugging in cables and adjusting the switches. And this is an ABC. And here is the ENIAC of 1945. And women were hired to operate this device. Okay, and then in 1953, Grace Hopper, another fabulous woman in STEM, dis develops the first computer language called the Common Business Oriented Language, or COBOL. And if you want to learn more about her, here's a crash course. You can always um, come back to these slides and learn more about her here. And then in 1954, John Backus and his team of programmers at IBM create Formula Translation, or Fortran. And then in 1958, Jack Kilby and Robert Noyce created an integrated circuit, which is also known as the computer chip. And it's a pretty vital part of computers. Um, and it's in basically all computers. So they were pretty important parts of how we have computers nowadays. Um, okay. And then... I just want to add something about, like, computer chips. Um, computer chips are made of, like, a bunch of circuits. So a circuit, you could think of it as, like, a light switch in your home, which is a big circuit. Um, it extends in through your wall. And then the um, resistors, which is the light, that's your resistor. And um, the switch is helping the circuit to form. And those circuits, you want to combine it into a very, very tiny um, little thing 
and that's called a computer circuit and it's made of made up of like many 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 circuits so like millions and today it's like billions circuits just small circuits that are combined or compact into such a small thing which is a very very um important inventions of computers yep very well said um and then in 1968 douglas engelbart created a prototype for the first modern computer and it included a mouse and a graphical user interface and this marked the turn of technology being for from like academics to the public so now basically anyone who wanted a computer could get one and then in 1970 intel is formed and it created the intel 1103 also known as the first dynamic access memory or dram chip and then in 1971 ibm engineers invented floppy disks which were portable disks that allowed information to be transported from one computer to another and um, your parents definitely remember like floppy disk if you ask them um they're another very innovative um, inventions at that time when um, computers memories are all stored on a single computer and can't like really bring things around but with this disk um, now all of a sudden you can do homeworks you can save homeworks on the, that disk and you can just bring it everywhere with you exactly yeah and then in 1973 Robert Metcalf created the Ethernet, which connected multiple computers and their hardware together, which is also a very important part of computers today, because without that, we wouldn't be able to have Zoom calls, um, which was a big part of how everyone stayed connected during COVID. And then in 1976, Steve Jobs and Steve Wisnight created Apple and Apple One which was the first computer with only one circuit board and ROM, which, as we mentioned before, is a secondary memory device. Um, and then in 1977, Apple II is introduced, and it includes color graphics and an audio cassette drive that could store information. And then in 1978, WordStar, or the first word processor, is created. And then in 1983, the Apple Lisa, or the Located Integrated Software Architecture, is the first computer that features a graphical user interface with a drop-down menu and icons. And this was also the first year that Gavillan SC releases their first portable computer that was designed to be flippable and it was also considered the world's first laptop. And then in 1985, in response to the Apple Lisa graphical user interface, Microsoft releases Windows. And um, I'm pretty sure that Apple Lisa was named after Steve Jobs' daughter, which is pretty interesting. I think that sounds correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then in 1996, Surgery Brin and Larry Page created the Google search engine at Stanford. And in 1999, Wi-Fi, or the wireless fiber network, is developed and initially only covered a distance of up to 300 feet. And then in 2001, Mac OS is released by Apple. And in 2003, AMD's uh, Athlon 64, or the first 64-bit processor for computers, is released into the market. And this is very beneficial because it was able to process more information than computers could before. Yeah, so um, going back, the Hollywood star um, Hetty, she uh, thought of the idea of Wi-Fi, or like the concept that is used in Wi-Fi in like 1940s, so... Um, it was not until the almost 2000, um, which is almost 20 years, 22 years ago, that we have the actual Wi-Fi network. Um, but 
obviously during these time, the government have been using it for like uh, military usage or any other things. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, and this is the last slide, I promise. In 2006, MacBook Pros are brought to the market by Apple, and this is the first Intel-based mobile computer. And then in 2009, Windows 7 is unveiled by Microsoft, and this gave users the opportunity to pin apps on the taskbar, which um, created easier previews of titles and more benefits. And in 2010, Apple launches their iPad, which I've used an iPad for a long time. So it's really crazy how it was only created like 12 years ago. And then in 2011, Google releases their Chromebooks, which runs on Google Chrome OS. And in 2015, Apple releases the Apple Watch and Microsoft releases Windows 10. And then in 2016, the first reprogrammable computer was created before they were immutable. Okay, now we're going into how a uh, computer size shrunk from before to now. Yeah, so um, for that, do you guys have any questions at all? If so, yeah. you guys can type into the chat. We're really happy to answer it. And um, hopefully, if we have um, time at the end, we can also answer like personal questions. Um, we're all juniors at CCA, so if you have any of that, exactly. you can we can do that too. Or we can answer questions about the course or anything like that. Yeah. So um, for this section, um, it's just we just want to like focus on how the computer shrunk from a um, a whole like. I don't know. But it took up a um, whole room. Yeah, previous. a whole room of computer to like a small, tiny, tiny phone that we have now. Um, it's a really like a huge change. And computers has only been um, existing for a really short time. So like the amount of um, inventions and innovations that we have come so far um, during this time, it's just, it's really mind blowing. Exactly. Okay, so for computers to shrink in size, um, there's either multiple parts um, in the computer that shrink, or the computer itself has shrunk into newer, smaller forms. And the last biggest cause for a shrinkage of technology is the creation of a microchip, which is a RAM chip that is similar to the motherboards of computers. and um, they are made of silicon and they are just smaller. So it's like really easy to put into devices and just have like smaller devices. And then these came out in 1961, um, which also it was used for military at the beginning. A lot of technology was used for military bases at the beginning and then later changed for public usage. Um, and now there might be a new reason for shrinkage of technology. Um, some might even go into our body, which is really crazy to me. And this is the nanotechnology. Yeah, so um, about the shrinkage of like chips, uh, my dad actually works at Qualcomm and he works in the chip department. I don't really know like the details, but that's, I've, I've been he hearing his um, meetings and that's what's been going on, I guess. Um, yeah, so he has a degree in electrical engineering, a PhD degree, and so what they're working on really is just, or like, really like the whole um, thing in electrical engineering is just like shrinking the chip as small as possible. So like, like I said earlier, um, we want to like shrink the a lot of like circuits and billions and billions of like small little wires into a small as small as chip possible so that we can put it anywhere we want um yeah so that's like the biggest goal of electrical engineering and yeah and so and obviously there is a limit to how small the chips can be but um they're just trying to figure it out how yeah, definitely. Um, they're just trying to figure out ways to make it even smaller, even if like chips 
itself can't get smaller, they're probably going to find out ways to make it fit into our body um, and just like make them really small, which is absolutely crazy. Okay, let's get back to, to the topic. Um, so for computers to shrink in size, um, there's multiple parts, as we said. Now we're going to go into the parts. Um, so computers itself used to be the size as of a whole room, as we mentioned before, but now they're small enough to fit into envelopes. Um, here's uh, an image of the very first computer ever introduced. Okay. And um, the first computer made in 1946 um, well, the one that was used a lot by the Nazi war machines was this one right here on the right. Um, and now they are used in almost every household, and they are much smaller and faster. Um, the next piece of computers is the hard drives. And as we have mentioned earlier, hard drives are secondary storage devices for computers that have saved information for long periods of time. The first picture here on the right shows what they look like in 1979, and they only carried 250 megabytes of data. And the newer hard drives like the SSD and the micro SD cards are much smaller, but it can store more information as well, and they are faster to use. So another part that has shrunk a lot since the beginning of computers are the RAMs or the primary storage devices. And computer RAMs are the, as the same thing as primary storage, as we said before. And the first picture is a William tube. And this is what the original RAMs of 1946 looked like. And they were not very fast at all. But now they are much faster. They're smaller, and some are even packed with RGB lighting. And modern RAMs can hold up to 128 gigabytes, which is a lot of data. Another part that has shrunk are the computer monitors. Old monitors were heavy, and there was a high chance that there would be problems in them or with them. And the first few computers were more technology than screen, and the pixel quality was low once the monitors were developed. And nowadays, monitors are thinner, lighter, and definitely more clear to see. And they come in multiple shapes, sizes, and designs as well. Yeah, so um, for pixels, um, a great reference is just the YouTube videos. So um, on the bottom of the YouTube videos, you can see like 720p's and the worst is obviously 360p. Um, you never want to watch those videos. So, so they're bad because their pixel uh, quality is very low, meaning that um, there are less pixels packed in a small a, a same size of screens and so you can see like the little squares everywhere which is which are really bad because it can't really show the um photos or videos that well so that's why we want like oh um 1080p's or like even higher i forgot the newest p but um yeah p stands for pixels and the pixel just helps us to see clearer um photos exactly um another computer that has shrunk are laptops when they were first put in the market they were just fancy word processors they were chunky heavy and slow but now brands are competing to produce the lightest, fastest, and thinnest laptops. And there is so much we can do on these computers, like gaming, um, computing, coding, typing. There's just so much we can do now. And they have a longer battery life as well. Um, and other computers and technology that has 
advanced compared to the past are unmanned air vesicles to miniature drones, calculators then versus now. Nowadays, they are more complex, easy to use, and some are even thin and clear like we can see in the picture right here. These are literally clear calculators. And other examples are portable speakers, then versus now. Back then, they used to be these really chunky, heavy boxes. And now, even our, like, Google or Alexa, they're really small, they're light, and they're, like, much more advanced compared to back then. Um, and even port portable music players, there was the Walkmans. Um, but nowadays... We can literally listen to music on Spotify and other apps. Um, also, televisions, they were chunky, like our monitors for our screen for the computers. But now they're also very thin and they're like bigger so we can see more and clearer. And phones also back then were chunky, but now they're much thinner. Um, portable cameras back then were also very chunky. Now they're clearer and smaller and produce colored images, which they didn't back then. And there's many more as well. Okay, and the last topic of today's um, discussion is the computers in AR and VR. Yes, yeah, so um, going back to the slide. So um, basically, um, we talked about like all about how the computer shrunk from a full room to laptops. Now we're going to talk about AR and VR. So AR stands for, we're going to talk about it later, but it stands for augmented reality. Um, augmented reality are basically like holograms. Um, and you can usually, or AR devices are usually like glasses. So that's what Apple has been doing uh, recently, our glasses. And VR are, um, I think some of you are familiar, which is the VR headsets um, that like covers your whole entire uh, face. And it stands for virtual reality. Yeah, that. And so um, Facebook has recently changed their name to Meta because they want to focus more on Metaverse now. So Metaverse is also another um, whole new thing in the um, STEM or the internet field um, aspects. So yeah, we're gonna get to that later. And I'm gonna send a couple of videos in the chat if you want to guys to check out like Metaverse and what is Metaverse more, you can um, click that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so how computers fit into glasses. So basically, Metaverse is a virtual environment that users can interact with. Um, and as Katie mentioned before, AR stands for augmented reality, which is a form of virtual reality. Uh, examples are holograms. And a big part of virtual reality is the sensory feedback, which is achieved through interactive hardware and software, which we talked a little bit about in the earlier slides, the parts of computers. And um, head-mounted displays and gloves and other accessories are also a big part of virtual reality and how you can um, you know interact with the environment in virtual reality um, and there's many more devices as well those are just a few examples and um, for virtual reality to occur two lenses are utilized to focus the user's eyes um, to the screen and it's automatically focus focused and um, On-screen visuals are shown through external devices like phones or other means of HDMI cables. And other technology in these devices are sensors and headphones. Um, headphones, obviously, to listen and sensors to help you guide you through the um, virtual environment. So yeah, that's just like some parts of how uh, computers can fit into these glasses. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. Um, I hope you learned a little bit more about computers in these slides today. And here are the credits. Yay.
Alright, uh, thank you so much for doing this lesson. And yeah, we hope you guys learned a lot. Um, that was definitely a lot of like content for the past mm -hmm. 45 minutes. But we, I'll send the link to the slides right now in the chat. And um, don't forget, obviously, to do the um, knowledge quiz. That is the way for us to like know that you learn the content and um, for you to like earn the um, course completion certificate at the end. Yeah, so regardless if you attend the live lecture or not, just um, complete those quizzes and the accuracy don't really ma matter. It's based on completion. So um, just let us know that you are engaging with the course and you're doing it and then you're um, going over the lectures and you're going to earn a certificate at the end. Exactly. All right. So um, any questions at all? Um, everything you can find it in Google Classroom and we'll also send it in Discord and now in the chat. I'll do that right now. So. Um, any questions at all? And we can also answer personal questions too, if you have any about high school. Um, Silicon didn't help shrink chips. It was just um, how microchips were created. They're used, um, or they are made with silicon. So, um, for pixels, here, let me, let me tell you how to, like, decrease the pixels. I can, I can do that, but, um, obviously you can just do, like, invert way to, um, increase pixels. So, decreasing pixels, um, basically you go into computer algorithms and then you look at, um, let's say you have, like, a big canvas, right? And then you look at, like, this part of the pixels and let's say like, oh, it's white, 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 blue, 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 and white, blue, white. And then you kind of just like average it out. And then you see, oh, like blue is more. And then you just make that whole pixel blue. So like you do that for a lot of pixels. And then you'll find your new canvas to be like bigger pixels of average of smaller pixels. And so you can store less information. And so that's why when your internet is bad, you need, um, they can only send like less pixels because it's less information. So they just kind of like throw out information or throw out um, pixels to make the cameras look worse, but it's sendable to you, if that makes sense. Yep, exactly. And then also, like, pixels um, in themselves, like, if there's more, it basically means that there's more data on the screen, especially if you don't increase the resolution. So it basically makes it clearer if there's more. That's the point. Any other questions? We can answer again any like high school questions because obviously I know that like back in middle school I had so many questions, just endless questions. I would love to like sit down with high schoolers and just go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get courses. Ooh, okay, so um, seniors have priority. So um, when you fill out like for the core selection, you have like four boxes for fall and four boxes for spring. Seniors um, get priority. So they get all the classes first. So or the counselors do seniors and then juniors and then sophomores and then freshmen. So if you're an incoming freshman, 
the it's very very likely that you're not going to get your classes that you chose or all the the um, things are going to get messed up and um yeah it's, it's the freshmen are the worst but um as you go into like or as you like get into uh, seniors becoming seniors then you get like more priorities and you get more um, classes yeah exactly and what she means by seniors are like rising seniors so yeah. currently juniors mm -hmm. yeah um yeah and also like freshmen it's not that they won't get the classes that they want it's like they're just less likely to get the mm -hmm. classes that they want because the spots are like all filled by the seniors exactly. yeah. any other questions like stem courses in cci maybe questions on that um, I know only really barely about Tori, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know a little bit about Tori, too. I went there in ninth grade, if you guys um, have any questions. Um, not really. It's just you need to have maybe two to three notebooks. Um, you should probably buy your supplies after you get your classes, though, just in case. Like, the classes you have in that semester aren't really subject, with, like, like you know, STEM-related or, like, more information-based. Um, so maybe wait until you get your classes. Yeah, and you but get, you probably you need, get, like, sorry. a notebook and binder that you're good. So, like, you get your classes um, before... Um, the first day of school so there's a thing called raven readiness which is if i don't remember but if this oh the first day of school is like mid-august then the raven readiness would be like around the start the very beginning of august so during that time you can see your classes and then you can meet your counselors and then you can determine which supplies you want to do but personally for me i have a binder and i don't really do notebooks because i don't like how heavy it is i use like a I, I i have like a stack of like line papers in my binder and then i just take out papers and then write notes on them and then put it into like the i use like dividers for each subject and i just put that in there yeah, yeah. um and for tori and cca this is really hard because like both are really good schools i found the environments to be pretty similar the only difference is Tory Pines is, other than academics, is known mostly for its sports. So if you're interested in sports, I would definitely recommend that school. If you're more interested in the arts, then go to CCA. Yeah, and um, like sports, arts, it's really, or um, CCA definitely, sports have definitely improved over time. Exactly. But when yeah. we say yeah. Tory is better for sports, it's because the academics is more it fits more with the sports schedule like if you're doing sports in cca the academics can really like get tough on you so like mm -hmm. if you're like really into sports you want to focus a lot on sports like getting recruited and everything then maybe consider tori because the the schedule is like lighter and you can like actually breathe there <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah and um next question do you do recommending doubling on in classes if you want to get it done as soon as possible, like for me, I double up on math um, because, well, I want to like go into more advanced math and um, also I double up on, in, I think, language because I want to get done with it. So if you want to do that, then you can do that. Oh, um, so the first day of school for me was, I was a little nervous because I moved to a completely new area when I started ninth grade, but um, I found the environment to be pretty fun. Everyone is kind of new when you're like a freshman, so it's really not that bad. Mm -hmm. Everyone is like just trying to make friends at the couple or at the beginning, so it's like not that bad. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and um, what order should we take chemistry, bio, and physics? So, um, hmm. 
in CCA, because I, I, I'll, I'm gonna answer CCA and Aisha I can answer okay. for Tori. So in CCA we do honors chem, AP chem, um, sophomore year, and then we do physics one and two, um, junior year, and then you can do like bio senior year, or you can switch. So you can do junior bio and then senior year physics and physics one and two. Yeah. And there's also physics C, which includes calculus. That's like very advanced. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And at Tori, um, chemistry is also 10th grade. Um, AP bio, you can do any year after freshman year. Um, and physics, I'm pretty sure it's junior year and above. I was not a junior there, so I do not know. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was junior and above. Yeah. And do you have to play a sport to be successful slash happy at Tori? Okay. No, no, no definitely <laughs> not. I um, went there, and I didn't really play a sport there either because I, like, went or I started school there around November. Um, so, like, our, most of the sport seasons that I was interested in were already, like, done. Or, like, or, like they started, and I couldn't really, like, like, try out for them. So I didn't. But it was still really fun. I made a lot of great friends there. So you definitely don't need to play a sport to yeah. be happy there. I play sport at CCM. I'm, I'm playing softball right now. And um, it's just being involved in athletics are just, like, it's a part of school. Like, I'm not a part of the CCA conservatories. And I'm not, I don't think I'm missing out on any arts because I'm taking other arts class in, class, uh, in school. So, like, you have to take PE, you have to take, or dance PE, so you are somehow, like, in some ways involved in athletics, and so doing sports in high school, it really depends on if you really like the sports or not, if you're forcing yourself to do the sports, and obviously, no, yeah, and um, it's just, like, different friends that you meet, um, sports, you can also do robotics, um, robotics okay. team, the FRC teams, um, FTC teams, they're all, they also feel like a family, and then you're creating, like, a robot in one year, and then you're competing, and you can also travel to Houston for world championships, um, it's, it's a whole thing, so, um, yeah, robotics, also good, um, arts, also good, and we also have conservatories in CCA, those also feel like a family for you. Yeah, exactly. And um, also to add on to that, um, just like finding things that you are interested in will make you happy. It's not mm -hmm. that you have to like do everything and be like well-rounded, just like doing things that you're interested in and like finding people that are the, like have the same interest as you would make you happy. Yeah. And do it, do things for yourself, do things for yourself and compare yourself to your potential. Don't compare yourself to others. Yeah, exactly. And um, Tori Gold, yeah, I, I heard that. Tori, um, I think lacrosse is also super good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're crazy. Yeah, no, they, yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, CCA, and also, CCA also has, like, CCA girls tennis. They're crazy. Yeah, good. they are really good. <laughs> and um, what languages are for in CCA? So, as... I know of our, I'm going to go quick, so we're running yeah. out of time. Um, ASL, Chinese, Spanish, Japanese, French. Japanese, no AP, and French. Yeah, five. And so ISP, um, ISP is follow the requirements. I'm not sure about ISP, but I know um, athletic credits. So you, sophomores to seniors you can do varsity sports and earn athletic credits. Yeah, that, that I know, but I, I'm not quite sure about ISP. Yeah, and it's like yeah. five per semester, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 All right, so um, let's not let Google cut us off, so we're just going <laughs> to end it here. Um, thank you so much for coming, guys, and um, I'll see you guys Friday again. I'll be teaching um, the course. It's on operating system, so I really hope you guys will be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, guys. Bye.